to another episode of Justification. Good morning to you. Hoping your morning has gone well thus far. And I'm hoping that your morning will increase in goodness by our time that we will spend together on this morning. Thus far, you know, we've reached um, some time together. We've reached a point in time where we're able to move on from where we last left off in, in a bit of a different avenue. We're able to move forward in our thought, putting these little pieces together of what this term justification means for our devotional conversation, for our devotional conversation's conscience, and for our holistic uh, development in our faiths, how our faith's holistic development can come together to form a, a belief that's credible to our individual person. We've been speaking a lot about how the Bible, its own self, tells us that a shift, it demands a shift from us. A shift from us is demanded and how we approach the things that are within the Bible, how we approach ourselves approaching the things that are within the Bible, and how we approach the living God's devotional character. The shift we have been speaking about, the shift we have been reviewing, it is a shift that the Bible supports. It is a shift the Bible teaches. And from thus forward, uh, seeing as how we have we have we have given care to the little intricate details, and there are more intricate details that we will get into. But the foundation is established. We needed a foundation in order to get to the point where we could understand what the Bible is is going to now tell us, because we're going to start getting into certain truths that are familiar to the Bible, but that may not be uh, familiar with traditional theological theory or traditional. Uh, Christian religion. So we're going to see a difference. We're going to sh we're going to see a difference in that shift. So the shift is is coming at us now. At maybe we were moving slow before, but the shift now is coming at us at a, at a more decent rate, and we can keep up with it because we have building blocks that we have established as as credible. And we will give more detail and more time to everything that we have been reviewing because it all comes back full circle. Trust. Everything comes back full circle. Everything means more than when you first initially hear it, when you first initially meditate on it or digest it. The Bible is calling for a shift that's important to our perception or to our lens spiritually and devotionally. We are to... We are to take our experience into our own hands in the sense of not claiming it, but being able to give it away. So there is a, there is a certain percentage of claim that we have to do, that, that, we, have, that, has, that we have to go through that in order for us to be able to give it out, up, and away. That claim, that claim comes from us taking uh, risk, risking our faith's intellect, risking our, 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 our home-bred belief, challenging home with the experience, allowing the experience to dictate what home's new home is. This is the, we're going to continually go back to it, but this is the verse in the book of Isaiah, the unknown ways that we are to be brought into, those dark paths that are to be transformed into light. We have no idea where we are going. This is the Abraham experience, but what we know is that there is something on the other end of that, not knowing that we are supposed to get to. We haven't clarified what that, that unknown is, and we will, we will clarify it. There will be a period of time where we, be, we will be able to clarify it. And once we do, once we do, once we put everything together, once everything uh, falls into the alignment that it's supposed to, you'll be able to understand why we have taken so long just to get to this one point, just to get to this one point. And it's worth it. It's worth it. We've been spending time together uh, every morning. And I've been giving you, you know, things, little things to put into practice. And I know that you have. And I know that you're allowing that challenge to, to work in its own way. Which may not be beneficial this month, this year, uh, next year, the, the year after. But, but everything is a seed sown. Everything is a seed sown. And the more that we water by allowing uh, ourselves to do and to learn is the more that seed will spring and the more the living God has a, a, the opportunity to do with us what, what should happen, what he will.
our faith is to go through a very dark course of learning, not dark as in violent. At times it may feel that way, but dark as in not illuminated. The reason for that is to grow accustomed to the devotional character of the living God. We have had false light, direct or pathway, into what is supposedly to be the living God's devotional character. Um, this is not real light. This is not real light. There is a light in our room, and then there is the light of the sun. As real as that light is in our room, it is not as real as the light of the sun. We've had fake light, and we have been comfortable with fake light. But now the Bible is saying, I'm going to cut that light off. And so now it's like, what do we do without that light in our room? Well, we have to discover a, a better light. And the discovery of that better light is us growing accustomed to the living God's character and allowing that joy in that character to be that light in that room. And this is, this is going against everything that we have believed, putting off our former conversation, as Paul advises, and being renewed in the spirit of our mind, as Paul advises. Putting off our former conversation is the first step. We have not proven why. But everything in the Bible and the apostles themselves are telling us that this is the first step, putting off the former conversation and being renewed in the spirit of our mind, which means putting off our former beliefs, uh, the former theories that we hold about the Bible and about whatever the Bible is saying and the characters in it, putting off our routines, putting off our, our complacencies, putting off our habits, putting off, putting off every tender thing that we have for that light that has been inherited or that we have willingly walked into. And we've gone through this in previous meetings before. But the question is why and it will always be why. Why why is the Bible saying this? Why is the Bible which clearly clearly through Moses gives a traditional pathway for priests to follow and to dictate the supposed religion? Of the living God. Why? Why would the Bible encourage this and then at the same time flip? And not even so at the same time. Originally the flip was there and then there was a flip to, to, to the traditional thought of Moses when it came to religion. And then now the Bible is saying that it's going to flip from the traditional thought of Moses to go back to the former way that things used to be. Why? Why would the Bible... 90% of the time in the Bible, supporting, why would it 90% of the time support the route of Moses and then in little bits and pieces speak about a change that the individual approaching the living God is to embrace in order to make that approach valid at that point in time and then beyond? Paul gives us an answer. Paul gives us an answer in the book of Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 19. Paul to the Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 19. After going through much through this, this chapter, we will get into this chapter um, greatly. But after, after giving a bit of a lecture on the purpose of the religious law from the side of, of Moses and its 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 weight, its its depth, its its credibility, and then its illegitimacy. Speaking about this in this chapter and allowing the the reader to get to a point in time to where that they can then question why all of this took place. Why why? Because this seems like confusion. Why this confusion? Why this jumping around of how to serve the living God? Is it by religious law or is it by um, experience? through the mind individually or personally? Why embrace or why teach a certain way, but then give another way through your chiefest apostle and his, um, his death, the illustration of it? Why take the time to secure so much in Moses and then to undo so much by this one individual? Paul answers this question. 
In the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, Paul says, Wherefore then serveth the law? So he's, he's gone in the previous verses. He's gone through the illustration of Abraham and of, and of the context of what the, the philosophy of the religious law means. What it meant, what it now means, and why it should not now mean what it formerly meant. Now getting to this point um, in his lecture, Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added. Now here is the answer. Why is the law relevant? Why was the religious law? Why was the religious policy put into place by Moses relevant? And why is this religious policy put into place by Moses? Why, is, why was it an example of relevancy for generations thereafter? Wherefore then serveth the law, says Paul. It was added because of transgressions. And here's the key. Till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Part B of that is not our concern. Part A of this is our concern. This law was only relevant for a certain period of time. This law, let me rephrase that. The philosophy of the religious law. To where one is acceptable to a or the divine eye via routine, via policies, by, by doing uh, deeds and rites and rituals and baptisms uh, through ceremonies um, in belief of theories and executing commandments. This was set into place for a period of time. It was not to go on beyond Moses. It was not to go on beyond Moses. It was added for that age for a specific reason against the living God. And when that region should find its conclusion, it should be no more. This routine, this policy, this belief, this theory of a credible uh, human being and devotional being to the eye of the deity should no longer be relevant when the seed should come to whom the promise was made. This is in reference to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18 18 and 19, Deuteronomy chapter 18, 18 and 19 reads, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it. I will require it of him. Now this verse in the book of Deuteronomy it is in reference to the living God's chief apostle. The one that came and actually spoke the living God's words just as prophesied. Spoke the philosophy of the living God so much so that he was crucified for it. Now Paul lets us know that when this individual should come, that this philosophy of the religious law and the carrying of the devotional conversation along with the, the routine and philosophy of the religious law as established or set up by Moses, that it should be no more. This routine should, should, should fail to exist when this individual comes preaching what he will preach, because what he preaches is actually the doing away of this philosophy and the establishing of a more credible experience, a more credible learning experience, a more credible loving experience, a more credible doing experience. When this individual should, should arrive on the scene of action, the philosophy that he will preach, the philosophy that he will bring, it will be the fulfillment of this in the book of Deuteronomy. And what is you know, now known or what was formerly established as the philosophy of the religious law, it should no more come into existence. It should no more come into remembrance. It should no more be that we, as, as individuals wanting an experience with the living God, wanting to know ourselves through the living God's words and through the living God's course of learning, return back to these former ways of, of initiation and continual routine for the supposedly development of our faith and the closeness of what is divine. This is old, this is former, which is why in the book of Ephesians, Paul says, put off your former conversation. 
the former conversation is that conversation that is established by what Paul is saying, by the philosophy of the religious law. The philosophy that one is, is, is valid in their belief, that one is valid uh, to also another's eyes and mind based upon the deeds that they do, based upon the routines that they fulfill, based upon the theories that they advocate, based upon the commandments that they're willing to do, based upon the baptisms that they are willing to go through. This is a former, this is this, this act. This belongs to our former conversation, the conversation that is tied to the earth and that is tied to the things on the earth. Those things are not secular things. The Bible is not a secular book. The things that the Bible is talking about are the things that are connected to the devotional conversation. Let that be what it will, whether it be voices, whether it be um, beliefs, whether it be feelings, whether it be thoughts, whether it be theories, whether it be principles or policies, whether it be routines or rituals, whether it be ceremonies or offerings. These are the things that are connected to the earth, not the literal earth. Again, think of that earth as italicized or in quotation marks, the earth of our religious denominational belief. Our conversation is to think higher than these things our conversation is formally, to be formally connected to them, meaning that a renewal in mind has to take place in order for us to break away from them. This routine, if we, if we are truly believing, if, we're, if you are right now believing that Jesus is everything for you, then one thing that needs to be understood is that with Jesus being everything for you, the number one concern of Jesus was your devotional conversations, conscience, the heart of your belief, the mind of your faith, and the intellect, the intellect of the integrity of your position when it comes to your course of learning through the Bible. That was this man's only concern. Drawing you nearer to the living God. As he said in the book of Mark, he does not say have faith in me. The man does not say have faith in I. The man says have faith in God. Every word that this individual spoke, he spoke to get minds upward to the temple above, where there are structures and where there are substances and where there are decent illustrations, not literal, this is all figurative, that we can take in and digest to draw us closer to the character embalming that temple. And so this routine, this routine of validating our belief through custom and through traditional theory was to end when this individual stepped on the scene of action and was to forever pass away when this individual passed away. His death, we will, we will pass through that illustration. This is significant. This is significant because we're told before this ever happens that this is supposed to happen in the book of Isaiah. Uh, we've, we've reviewed this verse before, but this is just relevant. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, verse 4 and 5. Isaiah, chapter 51, verses 4 and 5 says, Hearken unto me, my people, and give ear unto me, O my nation. For a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. Again, a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. My righteousness is near, my salvation is gone forth, and mine arms shall judge the people. The isles shall wait upon me, and on mine arm shall they trust. Now this is where it gets interesting, because the Bible is saying, or rather the living God is saying, that my righteousness is near. Now in, in correct language, this word righteousness means beneficence. My beneficence is near. Now, we can look at this from two perspectives. The beneficence being the, the, the traditional thought, which is the man. Or that beneficence being what we're told that beneficence is within the verse. Again, a law shall proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light of the people. In the book of Isaiah, there is not a man that is a light to the people. There is a specific judgment, commandment law, or understanding. This is the beneficence that is to be drawing near. 
And this changes much. This changes the direction of our thought because traditionally we are we are trained to believe that the light is is conditioned to a male form and to a belief about that male form as being more than male while still being male. The Bible lets us know differently. And depending on the reading, our mind may go where it may go, but the, the Bible remains plain. From the book of Deuteronomy to the book of Galatians to the book of Ephesians to the book of Isaiah, that light that was to enlighten, that light that is to enlighten, it is a commandment, it is a, a law, it is a judgment, it is a philosophy. The living God's righteousness is the living God's beneficence. The living God's salvation is the living God's beneficence. These are one and the same. There, there is no difference between them. This beneficence, this beneficence is an act. This act, this act, it is, it is, it is understood by, and we we haven't we haven't gotten to this part or through this yet. We've only given. And, and have been building up on pieces of it. But this act, it, it is the, the strengthening of the mind, of the renewing or the refreshing of the spirit of the mind. This act is the ability to, and the confidence, the confidence to put off the former conversation and to put on a new mind, a new, a new mind, directing the conversation. The beneficence that is spoken of, we will see is reflected in the living God's chief apostle in the illustration of his death in the illustration of the rising. This figurative illustration is an analogy to our living experience with the words of the Bible. We will see and we will learn that the Bible is directing our attention not to a man and if it be to the deed and we will understand that deed in its in the way that it should be understood. But ultimately to what the individual himself directed people to. True, he said, I am the light of the world. And this I, it is not, it is not, you know, possessive, it is it is not as conditional as we assume it to be, based on traditional thought. This I has no reference to the individual himself. Because how much ego would that be? How much ego would that be as I am the light of the world? We may say that there is another who says that I am the light of the world and whose symbol is the light. But in right context of language, this I am the light of the world. This I is not, is not singular as an individual. Reading in context and understanding in context this I is my words. My words are the light of the world. And I can say that. I can say that because just now, reading in the Bible, he shall speak my words. In the book of Isaiah, we, we read in our last meeting, in previous meetings, the isles shall wait for his law. Now in the book of Isaiah 51, a law shall proceed from me. This law, my judgment will be the light of the people. And then in the next verse, my righteousness is near, my salvation is come. On my arm shall they trust. This individual gave the living God's philosophy in a way that fulfilled the prophecy of himself that was uttered by Moses and fulfilled. This individual spoke that commandment of the living God. He spoke the beneficence or the intention that the living God has for the devotional conversation and for it was crucified. It was crucified because it went against the traditional scheme. We are not supposed to have possession of our experience to the traditional scheme, but to the living God, to the mind of the Bible, we are supposed to own our experience that it can become real enough that we can give it away, that we can possess it to give it away. 
to get to the point where we can say, as it says in the book of Luke, I commend my spirit into thine hands. To where we can get to the point where we are strong enough to let go of our conversation, to stop harassing it with various theories and with various commandments and with various policies to then where we can give it away. To where we don't mind our experience renewing our conversation, to where we don't mind our, our situation in the Bible, learning, whatever that may be, doing something positive to challenge our thoughts and to challenge our feelings that we can exercise for growing fond of that experience and for growing fond of what the Bible is saying. See, the Bible is a living book. We, we say that, we believe it, B-I-B-L-E, basic information before leaving earth, basic instruction before leaving earth. And yet while, while we would say that, we would give credibility or we would give our lens or our scope of belief to, to figures we have no real contact with, nor can we ever, except via our thoughts and via our belief, lending energy to that. Well, the Bible is telling us to have real contact with its words. And the Bible is allowing us to know this because it's, it's, it's good for our human being. Our human being needs this dark course of learning in order for it to blossom into what it should be. We are where we are, we have what we have, we have been led into what we have been led into. We have walked into whatever belief we have walked into, fine. But that's not the end of the story. Our faith has a brain, and our faith has thoughts, and our faith has feelings. And the cultivation of those thoughts and feelings and of that brain determines how valid our experience will be in reality. In reality. In reality, meaning how our faith will carry us in decisions that it needs to, in experiences where it needs to, in affection where it needs to, in giving affection, and in giving empathy where it needs to. Our faith, our faith is to determine our human character, not our human character determining our faith. And this is the shift. Human character should not determine faith, and this was the old routine where the humanity dictated the spirituality. Now, the Bible is saying your spirituality should be dictating your humanity in the sense of it's correcting your human being via you correcting your spiritual being. We need this correctness. The Bible knows we need this correctness and exercise with it. Mm -hmm.